Thank you. Good morning. Uh, hope you're all enjoying conference so far. Um, my name is Michiel Rook. I'm from the Netherlands. And today I'll be telling a little story. For the next 50 minutes, roughly 45 minutes, I'll be talking about a project that took almost a year, uh, which means I'll compress a little bit. Um, what I'll be talking about may or may not apply to whatever you're doing daily. Um, if it does, then great. If it doesn't, then maybe we can think of ways to get it there. But um, this worked on a particular project. It may not work on yours. So that's the disclaimer that I want to start on. Right. A little bit about me. I'm a Java, PHP, and Scala contractor based in the Netherlands. I do some international consulting as well, but mostly in the Netherlands. Uh, I train and coach teams, and I do some speaking, such as this conference. Um, I am part of a little company called Make.io, where we uh, coach, consult, and uh, deliver technical uh, products uh, around continuous delivery and continuous deployment. And I'm also part of a group of Dutch and Belgian web freelancers called the Dutch Web Alliance. If you, after this talk, uh, want to shout complaints uh, or general nastiness to me, then that's my Twitter handle. Uh, compliments are also welcome, of course. Um, yeah, let's get going. I'll talk a little bit about the background of this story, how it came to be, uh, where it was, where it all took place, uh, the approach we took, then a little bit about process and standards that we were setting uh, with the team and as a team, uh, a little bit about build pipelines, and to close off, uh, lessons learned, which there were a few. Right, now this all took place in 2014 and 2015 in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands. Specifically, the north of Amsterdam, which is, as you can see, has a beautiful view over the river that runs right through Amsterdam, the I River. Um, and this company, part of the Persgroep, which is a Dutch-Belgian uh, conglomerate of newspapers and uh, news sites, they also operate uh, a few job boards. And one of the biggest job boards pictured there uh, the national job site uh, for, for Dutch jobs. Um, that's one of the most visited job sites in the Netherlands. Now, as I said, this all took place in 2014, 2015. This was a traditional organization. Lots of, well, waterfall-esque uh, uh, development processes, and that had to turn around. They were dealing with a system called San Diego. Uh, the relation to the actual city is completely coincidental, by the way. Um, they just needed a name, apparently. It's called San Diego. Also called the big ball of mud, the big ball of yarn, uh, the big ball of nastiness. A large legacy monolithic application, which happened to generate significant money for that company. Read millions of euros. Uh, it was also very slow, very complex. Hard to maintain, lots of technical debt. Um, this came to be from a history of takeovers and mergers within the company that led to other code being ingested into the system or quick fixes, hacks. Uh, you probably know uh, what, I'm, what, I'm, uh, what, I'm, what I mean with that. Um, so it was a big, relatively messy code base uh, that took lots of work for simple features to get delivered. Also, the team that was dealing with this application had relatively limited confidence in the application, so they became very careful when changing it. Now, San Diego looks a little like this. In the top, we have three job sites that the, this company offers, um, and they all go through the same set of load balancers, varnishes, etc. From those load balancers, you end up in a front-end server, which connects to a back-end server or multiple back-end servers. The problem with that is that they run the exact same code, and the only way to distinguish between the two is a flag. You are front-end, you are back-end. But they run the exact same repository. Um, sometimes they can talk crosswise to each other or depth-wise, um, and it, part of it is through an API, part of it is through direct database calls. So it was a little bit complicated, a little bit messy. And then in the bottom, there's a bunch of external services like databases and solar and other stuff 
that this system would connect to. Now, the release process for this application was long and uh, consistent of large amounts of downtime. So releases were scheduled over the weekend. Now, the problem with the job site is that in general, people that are looking for a job don't look for the job during the week. They look for jobs at night and in the weekend. And the people that actually put the jobs on the site, recruiters, companies, they only do that from 9 to 5 daily, on working days. So taking the site offline during the weekend means that the paying customer, aka the recruiter, doesn't notice, but the people that actually use the site to improve their life, find a new job, find a better job, well, sites offline, they can do that. And this happened regularly. Every four or five weeks, they went down for, well, a few hours at best, and a, a one or two days at worst. And then the days after would be firefighting, right? The firefighting, the release that was just deployed. Now, as I mentioned, infrequent and manual releases, um, the tests that this project had were, if they were there, they were extremely fragile. So they would fall over for no apparent reason and slow. So not really trustworthy. Velocity, development velocity of the team was low. Um, apart from firefighting new releases, there were frequent outages and frequent issues, performance problems all across the board. Uh, a team that was becoming more and more frustrated with this system. And like I said, they had low confidence modifying that existing code. Now, all these problems put together, management and developers, of course, everybody started thinking, how do we improve? And management set a few goals. One of the most important goals, of course, reduce the number of issues, the number of outages, the number of the time spent firefighting by the team. Also, very important, reducing lead and cycle times. Now, the lead time and the cycle time are almost interchangeable, not quite, but basically they mean um, the time it takes for an idea to be put into production or to actually be usable by the end user, by the customer. Now, in San Diego's uh, uh, world, that could take three or four months. A long development process, a, a team that had low confidence in modifying the code, and then a release schedule which is every four to five weeks. So all these things combined, you have a cycle time, or lead time, I mean, which is easily two to three months for simple features already, which in the current climate, at least for job sites, is unacceptable, right? Other companies are moving so much faster, so you have to keep up, up with them purely from a, a competitive standpoint. Now, increasing productivity was also very important. Uh, getting the team uh, at a higher velocity and making, getting them in control again, uh, but also increasing the motivation for those developers, and not only the developers, but everybody involved with that system, right? Now, if we have these four goals, then the question becomes, what do we do? We can either refactor the current system, or we can rebuild. And by refactoring, I mean piecewise, put it pulling pieces from the code, making them better, and improving that way. They started doing that, um, and after three months of very enthusiastic refactoring, they had a test suite which ended up with 2.5% code coverage. Um, now, this was, in, in terms of percentages, this was a three- or four-fold increase of what they had. So this was pretty spectacular, right? But in absolute terms, it's not really useful, 2.5%. And that also means that if you uh, extrapolate that line, it will take years to get to some sensible number, like 70 or 80 percent. So that was, well, obviously not going to work. Something like a commercial off-the-shelf product was also considered. The problem with that is um, you can uh, buy a job site somewhere, and you can probably modify a logo or a few colors here and there, but this company is built around the job site. So it needs to innovate on the job site. When you buy something off the shelf, the ability to innovate is greatly lessened, or maybe even zero. So that's out of the question, too. And then a cut over rewrite or rebuild was considered, where we ex essentially built the new system, like the old system, 
but with a better design. And then at some point, we flip the switch. The problem with that is you rebuild all the bugs and all the problems that you have in the old system because they have become features over time, right? People expect it to work that way because it always worked that way, even if it was wrong. And a lot of the why, the reasoning behind certain features, certain code, has, be has become lost. It's stuck in a drawer somewhere, or the people that thought of it have long left the company. So you don't really know why things are that way. Right? So that was out, the, out of the question as well. So that's very positive. Well, the approach we took is something called strangulation. And now I don't mean the physical act of strangulating, but it does really, um, there is a, a resemblance. And I'll show you in a little bit what I mean with that. API first, so instead of doing all sorts of weird internal procedure calls, we consider everything an API and consume your own dog food. So if we, um, ex um, if we hand or if we open up APIs to other people, to other parties, to other companies, to inject jobs, for example, we use the same APIs internally as well. Otherwise, we will never get the API to the level of where they're actually useful, right? So consume your AP own APIs. We have services per domain object in this case, and the domain objects would be a job and a job seeker and a few other things. So the services would not necessarily be microservices, a little bit bigger, but small enough for our case. And we started migrating individual pages, individual pages on the site. And what do I mean with that? The strangulation pattern on the left, we start with the monolith, which connects to a database, and it is in, um, it is in contact with the internet, so it can be accessed from the internet. Step two, we add a proxy between the internet and the monolith. And initially, that proxy doesn't do anything. It just passes the traffic one-to-one -to, -one to the monolith, right? But then we start adding a new service. And that could be a front-end as well. Um, and it, and um, it has some functionality. We developed some feature in that new service, and at some point it's ready, and we can put a switch in the proxy that if you access that page, whatever that service is implementing, we route the traffic to the new service. And the traffic doesn't end up on the original monolith anymore. And then we build services, and we build services, and et cetera, et cetera, until at some point the monolith is not actually doing anything anymore. It's not receiving any traffic. In effect, it has been strangled, the strangulation pattern comes from a tree which grows on another tree and basically constricts or strangles the original tree, its host, until the host no longer can survive and withers and dies. All very positive again, but in this case, it would be our monolith, right? So at some point, we have enough functionality for our monolith to be obsolete, and we can throw it in a bin. And the proxy could look something like this. This is an Apache. And what this little snippet says is that for people on our, inter our own internal network, let's say that IP range, we rewrite everything feature slash to the new service, and the rest goes to the monolith. And we can then, at some point, if we're happy with how that is performing internally, we can remove that condition and let everybody see it. And we iterate and iterate like that. Now, we also said that every service that we have needs to be scalable. So it needs to be behind a load balancer, so we can easily scale up and down the number of replicas per service. Um, unfortunately, we need to be able to access some legacy databases and convert that data. We need to do continuous deployment from day one. What that means, I'll explain in a little bit. Everything as a Docker container, so Docker containers all the way, uh, every service as a container. And I mentioned this before a little bit, the front ends are services as well. They expose an API, right? They're accessible through HTTP. Um, and in turn, they use APIs to access other services. So the front ends are at the exact same level as the other services. And we consider them as such. That leads to this architectural overview where we still have the three sites, but now instead of a group of front-end services, they are served by their own front-end services. 
for the three sites. They in turn connect to internal services using APIs, which have access to their own data storage, search engines, what have you. And then San Diego is off on the side. It's actually in a different data center. All the new stuff is on Amazon in this case. And we have a tunnel between the two networks so that if we need to access legacy data or legacy code, we can access that through a tunnel. So now that we have an architecture in place, uh, it's very important to set a process. And the process in this, this particular project was um, kick-started by a few external consultants, of which I was one, but the team was involved from the very, very beginning, because team acceptance is key for something as dramatic as this. Right? So they were involved from the very beginning. Um, one of the process changes that we said is that everything is going to happen continuously. And by everything, I literally mean everything. We um, go from a project-type development life cycle to a product-type development cycle. So in a product-type cycle, is, it only has a start, it has an end. The only end you have is when you say, OK, my product is now obsolete and I don't offer my product anymore, which in this case would mean that the company doesn't exist anymore. So there isn't an end like you have in a project. We have a six-month project, and then we have another six-month project. No, this is a product, so it keeps evolving continuously. Everything we do is continuously. Um, the talk, or the name of this talk, is The Road to Continuous Deployment. Now, that particular phrase, continuous deployment, there's some confusion on what it actually means. And I'll give my view today. Um, there are some differing views, that's all fine, but I'm going to give my view. CD starts with continuous integration. This is a pattern that's older. It basically says we have a developer somewhere, checks in some code to GitHub, GitLab, whatever, and some process starts building that code. Now, in terms of PHP, building may or doesn't mean compiling, like it does in Java or Scala or other languages, but building could still be like minifying your JS or your CSS or combining other stuff, uh, linting, syntax checks, all those things. Those all happen in the build step. And of course, running tests happens there as well. Now, CI, you can have uh, Jenkins or Travis or Circle or any other tool um, that basically all do the same. At the end, you have an artifact. It may be a FAR archive or a ZIP or a TAR or something else that is deployable, but it doesn't actually do anything with the ar artifact other than generate it. Now, continuous delivery then takes the artifact and automatically deploys it to some acceptance environment. And on the acceptance environment, we can then do manual checks, click through it, verify the product, and then at some point we can deploy it to production. Now, deploying to production should be automatically, as in we need to have scripts which can automatically deploy to production. But as you see the red arrow there, the actual invoking of the script or the triggering is a manual action. So there's still human involved, right? We deploy to acceptance automatically as soon as the artifact is completed in the build stage. And then at some point somebody says, okay, this is good enough, stomps on a, on a button somewhere and the deploy to production happens. That's continuous delivery. What continuous delivery also states is that code is, should always be deployable. And by that, it, me it means, of course, that you cannot break your master branch or your trunk. Um, it should always be deployable in a deployable state. Now, continuous deployment, then, is what some consider the holy grail. All the arrows are green. There's no human involvement anymore. Basically, this means that we, from the build stage, we deploy to acceptance, which at this point loses its meaning, the name at least, because there's nothing to accept other than automated processes which do acceptance. So depending on your automated checks, it may be called staging or pre-production or functionally equivalent to production, whatever. If that all goes well, everything comes up in staging or acceptance correctly and works, we then automatically deploy to production. 
and there's no human involvement anymore. Now, the idea is that if you automate this from start to finish, and my per personal um, wish or my personal metric is that by the end of production, it should take no more than 20 minutes from the actual first push to GitHub. So that's a very short process. If you do that uh, like that, it takes the excitement out of releases, out of deploying. If it happens so often, it's, it's become standard, right? Now, why would we do this? One of the things in continuous delivery and deployment is that it, it allows us to do small steps, right? If we could release every single commit, and the commit is very small, we don't commit entire pages of code, right? So every step that we deploy is very small. It also allows us to get early feedback on whatever we're working on. Remember that I was talking about product lifecycle. We have an idea. Let's put this feature in for 50% of our users. And we don't want to wait for that release cycle to get us there in the next 4 to 8 to 16 weeks, whatever. Because that would then mean that we get feedback which is A, not early, but B, influenced by all the other things that are part of that release, right? So it becomes impossible to track those variables. Reducing time to recover. If you have a, a pipeline which deploys to production in 20 minutes and you have a serious issue, which is a, a bug in the code, uh, and if, for example, it was the last commit that broke it, revert that last commit, and 20 minutes later, everything's fine again. And last but not least, experimentation. Product lifecycle, product IDs, combined with early feedback, lead to experimentation. A product manager or product owner thinking like, if we try this, move this button there, or change this on the page, or whatever you can think of, how do, how do our consumers react? This is something that Netflix and Amazon do constantly, right? If we change the background of the movie title to another color, do people click more or less on it? Uh, if we do this, do people react in a certain way or a certain, another certain way? So that's very important in continuous deployment, that it allows you to experiment with product ideas. And teams that do continuous deployment in general suffer from these incredible statistics that they deploy 200 times more frequently than teams that don't. They recover from failures 24 times faster. Uh, change failure rate, which is th three times lower, but the most impressive one, two and a half thousand times shorter lead times. So that means that instead of three months, we end up with a week tops of lead time. Now, one of the things we said early on in this team is that we need to do TDD as a, as a rule. Who here regularly performs TDD? Is roughly what I expect. It depends a little bit on the audience, how, many, how, much, uh, how many hands I see. Uh, anywhere from 25 to 50 percent. I rarely get above 50 percent. So that's, that's par for the course. BDD then. Yeah, that's also... Usually you see 40 to 50 percent of the audience say, I regularly do TDD, and then the BDD is... 30 to 40 percent of that. I'll explain in a little bit why this is extremely necessary. Now, I talked about pushing commits and deploying commits. One of the rules you say is that every commit goes to production. And by every commit, I mean it could be two or three commits, depending on where, when our uh, Jenkins, in this case, starts. There could be a small window, small delay, uh, so, so two or three commits may be grouped, but it's not going to be more than that. And assuming all the tests are green, et cetera, et cetera, that can, those commits end up in production within 10 to 20 minutes. That requires a few um, things within the team, and what they discovered quickly was this. Only commit to master. And by only committing to master, or trunk, if you will, I mean we don't use branches ever. Bring in the pitchforks. <laughs> this is the 
Uh, when, I, when I say don't use branches ever, I always get reactions from sure to downright hostile, um, which is why I included the pitchfork image. But I'll explain why. This is, well, one nice image of what branches do for you. Um, but what branches do for you in real life is they delay integration. And by delaying integration, I mean, depending on the lifetime of your branch, it takes a while for it to merge back to master, at which point you'll run tests or you run deploy. Um, and we try to do small steps, which is impossible if you have long branches, because they end up being one single commit, a merge commit, which could be pages of code, right? Um, what I also think in terms of branches is, and this is going to sound a little bit harsh, but it's an abuse of version control for functional separation. And by that I mean uh, feature branches are used to separate, to functionally separate, or to separate functionality. Right? Product owner says, okay, this feature is now ready, it can be merged to master, which is abusing version control for the act of separating different functionalities or releasing functionalities in a, different se in a certain sequence. And I'll, I'll give an, an alternative in a little bit. Uh, but no branches also means no pull requests, because they are branches, no matter how long the pull request exists. Hopefully it exists for only a few hours, depending on if somebody is ready to review the pull request. But there are still branches. There is one exception, and one exception only, and that's work in progress or prototyping. And prototypes, of course, are thrown away after we're done with them, right? Um, but they can be put on a branch if other people on the team need to see it. Now, I hear you think, okay, no pull requests, how the hell do we do code reviews then, right? Pair programming. <laughs> I would not advise, advise doing it like this, it's not particularly effective. But still, pair programming. We don't enforce this, but we encourage this. The team learns very quickly to do pair programming, po <coughs> excuse me, pair programming, because it's a continuous code review, right? You put two people together, and hopefully it's uh, one person that's a little bit more experienced combined with a person that's a little bit less experienced, so you get knowledge transfer as well. And so you mix experience levels, but you get a continuous code review. Right? Instead of one developer hacking on his or her laptop and then checking it in, pull request, another developer checking that pull request, you now bring those two people together and in line make it better. And, and this is a lot faster. It leads to emergent design that's a lot more um, lean than it would with branches or pull requests. It requires discipline though, and not everybody is comfortable continuously sitting next to another person, uh, but that's something that you can get used to, at least that's my experience. Um, it also means that we pair on everything, and with everything, I mean scripts for automation, uh, server setups, all those things, because it becomes a team responsibility. And I'll discuss that in a little bit as well. Focusing on value. I talked about the strangulation pattern, and that we build up a new service to strangle our monolith at some point. Now we want to deliver value for the business again, right? Increase their confidence in us again. Restore cooperation. So that means that we focus on value creation and not necessarily on just moving parts out of the old system and copying them verbatim, but we focus on new features. And new features are only developed in the new system. So we don't touch the monolith unless we absolutely positively have to, because it's still generating money. But in principle, new code only in the new system. And we focus on value. Feature toggles are an incredibly powerful tool to not only separate functionality, but also do A-B testing. And separating functionality, I talked about feature branches and people using feature branches to, sequence, uh, to make a sequence of functionality. Now, feature toggles allow you to do the same, 
but without interfering in the purely technical act of deployment, right? Deploying is a purely technical exercise. It has no relation to business because it's just releasing software. And if you put new stuff that shouldn't be seen by a customer yet behind a feature toggle, and a feature toggle is essentially an if statement, they will not see it, but the code will actually be integrated, will be tested, will be deployed. And at some point when the product owner says, okay, now it's time to go, we flip the product or the feature toggle and customers start seeing that new feature. At which point we remove the feature toggle, of course. We only try to use that on specific things, systems or functionality that a customer would not yet see anyway, are, uh, don't have to be behind a feature toggle. And in some cases, the new functionality is not a problem to see, to let see. But it also means that we can do A-B testing. Like I have a new version of our search page on the right hand side. And I want to check whether the metrics for that page go up or down, like the number of users on the page, the time they spend on the page, the number of clicks, all those metrics. And initially, I want to say 10% uh, of my visitors get the feature toggle enabled. And then we see metrics happening. And if the metrics are not worse than currently, then we increase that feature toggle, the percentage. And we let the people, 50% of our traffic, see the new feature and then 100%, and then we remove the feature toggle. And at that point, this whole stuff in the monolith, for example, is obsolete and can be thrown away, cleaned up, right? Another process rule, the Boy Scout rule. Who does not know the Boy Scout rule here? <laughs> the Boy Scout rule basically says, leave the campsite in a better state than you found it. Um, which in translated to code um, means that if you see something that can be refactored in a reasonable amount of time, then you should do that at that point. Because if you don't, it leads to something called the broken window syndrome. The broken window syndrome is you have one broken window in a house, in an apartment complex, and okay, it's only one broken window. We can, we can handle that. But if it doesn't get handled, a second broken window appears. And people are like, this complex is starting to look shabby. And then a third and a fourth, and at that point, people don't care anymore, right? And the, the outside look of the complex is now shabby, and people consider that complex to be of that quality as well. So if you want to avoid the broken window syndrome, it means that every single time a window breaks, you fix it quickly. Quality is a precondition for speed. If you don't have quality, you can't go fast. Yes, you can go fast for a limited amount of time, but you will hit a brick wall pretty quickly. And if you are careful about quality, you can um, increase the amount of time spent linearly with the, with the complexity of the, or the features that you have. In PHP, one of the quality gates we would have is a simple syntax check, right? Simple linting check. Because we don't want our customer to see a fatal error somewhere, or you remove that method, or you forgot a brace or a semicolon somewhere, right? But it also means that we have tests in all shapes and sizes. It means that we have code coverage, which is at a level that we can trust. And in this project, and this is actually something the team came up with themselves, um, we had a very hard definition of code coverage, 100%. Now, note the asterisk. Because this was a PHP project, um, if it were Java or Scala, I would probably, we would probably get away with 80%, something like that. That's a sensible number. Reason why is there you have a compiler which helps you. Right? If I remove a method in PHP I, and a test doesn't catch it, I will know about that runtime, and that's too late. In a compiled language, my compiler will hopefully hint me about that. But in this case, we set a hard gate on 100%, which means that if the coverage drops to 99.9%, .9%, the build fails. This means that we have a safety net, 
Now, there are exceptions, of course, very, very uh, small exceptions, which can be annotated by code coverage ignore, but every single instance where that might be needed would be a conscious decision, right? Whereas if you have an 80% number, as long as the 80%, you're still along the 80%, then you don't really know whether the code you're not covering is essential or a stub or something trivial, right? With 100%, if you drop to 99.9 .9 and the 0.1 would be trivial code, then you can make a conscious decision, okay, ignore that particular piece of code, right? But it becomes a conscious decision. We also envision DevOps. DevOps is a very popular tool these, or, or a term these days. Everybody wants DevOps. What does DevOps actually mean? And at this point, it's, um, it's starting to become a container phrase uh, because people started adding security on it, and then QA, and then biz, and then net, and then sys, and then... Blah, blah, blah. What I mean with DevOps is DevStar Ops. DevStar Ops basically solves this problem. <laughs> it means that we don't have walls between us anymore, right? Um, instead of us generating an artifact and throwing that over the wall, and then the ops team taking that, deploying that somewhere in production, a production system we, that we as developers are not allowed to touch, and then it breaks. And uh, okay, why did it break? Yeah, 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 because X, Y, Z, uh, ops may, doesn't even know about it or doesn't even have the insight into the application, so they only have logs. Oh shit, we didn't actually put that in the logs, or can we get the logs? Uh, can we access the server? Uh, no, you can't, because we are only allowed to access the servers, and this round robins a few times, ping pongs a few times, and the end result is that we're slower than we could be, right? So if we integrate that, those people into the same team, we foster responsibility. Responsibility for a product which resides at one team, not multiple teams, one team. And if it breaks, somebody on that team will get a page. It doesn't matter whether it's ops or dev or QA or somebody else, somebody on the team will get a page. And the funny thing about that is developers don't like being paged at night. Go figure. Most people don't like being paged at night. But usually ops people have that in their contract, right? They do night shifts and standby and all those things. They expect stuff to break. Sometimes they're even um, sad when things don't break. <laughs> Go figure. So what we do is by integrating all those people and suddenly a developer at night gets paged. And he's like, why the hell is this page? And the ops will be like, yeah, this happened for years, every day. And it's just, why? Well, it, it wakes me up. So I, immediately, we start getting rid of that. That's the effect that this will have, that DevOps will have. We will get rid of this problem because it hinders us, right? It will also require a culture change. It's a culture where people actually talk to each other and together solve problems rather than pointing fingers everywhere. Enough about DevOps. I talked about continuous everything. One of the everythings is monitoring. And by monitoring, if you can put it on a dashboard, then put it on a dashboard. Stuff like, how's my uh, system performing? And these are technical metrics. CPU, RAM, load, et cetera, et cetera. Log files, centralized logging, uh, elk stack, Elasticsearch, uh, hopefully with some sort of ID so you can uh, correlate different requests together within services and you have a life cycle of where things start to go wrong. Stack traces, everything that your app produces, let it be searchable and centralized so we don't have to log into an individual service and look at log files. Right, all these things lead to a build pipeline. And the build pipeline should be all about automation. Automating what is repeatable. Why do we automate? Because if we um, let humans do the work, mistakes start to slip in, start to happen. If you have 10 tasks for 10 humans, they will do it in some sort of way. 
and give the same 10 humans, the same 10 tasks the next day, and you will already see variations. Because of lack of sleep, problems at home, uh, had a little bit too much to drink, etc., etc., etc. All those reasons which an automated script or process doesn't really have a problem with, right? It will do the same thing every single time. And we automate building, testing, deploying, orchestrating, so getting services together and initializing services or servers, and configuration. All the things we used to do manually, like uh, boot up some VM and do a bunch of apt-get install stuff, we automate all those things so that we can throw stuff away and make it happen again. Continuous everything also means continuous testing. Continuous testing in depth. And in depth, I mean that we start with unit tests, so that's where TDD comes back. We then go to integration tests, acceptance tests, and UI tests. Unit tests could look something like this. This is relatively recent PHP unit code. And what this code does is test a single unit, a single object, single class, and all the dependencies that that object has are marked away so that we can control the world around that object. Integration tests then are where we test components together. We actually test life cycles of objects, or objects talking to each other. We may connect to an actual database with test data, fixtures, data fixtures, or we test using you know, SQLite instead of MySQL with some uh, fixed known test data that we can then assert on. Acceptance tests, are that's where BDD comes in. And BDD says we generate or we create scenarios using a syntax like that, which is called the Gherkin DSL. And the Gherkin DSL always runs in the same flow, given when then. Given the world is in a certain state, a predefined state, when something happens, then a verifiable outcome should be able to be detected. And these stories, or these scenarios rather, are the result of stories, of acceptance criteria. They are the result of examples, of edge cases, for example. These are actual examples of functionality. And they can be implemented by code in the background, but this is in our domain language or ubiquitous language, this is what we write down. We don't actually write code anymore. In this case, we do need to implement that, of course, but it's an acceptance criteria, it's business language. This can be done using BHAT or PHP spec, for example. And then last but not least, we do UI tests. UI tests using something like Selenium or uh, Phantom or Protractor, what have you. You fake a browser. You can detect JavaScript issues. Um, the problem with that, or the potential issue with that, is that speed and stability are a problem, could be a problem. Selenium is not very fast. Uh, Phantom JS and Protractor have some stability issues here and there. So we don't want to overuse that. Now, our manual tester or our QA person in this, in the previous process would then be, if he sees something like this, like what, it, what is going to be my role? Right? I used to click through an acceptance environment on my own and verify whether things were ready for release. Funny thing is, the tester is actually going to be more important than ever. Don't tell them that. Because the tester becomes a part of the three amigos. And the three amigos is basically a business representative, a development representative, and a testing representative. Because these three people combined should have enough knowledge of the business, the system, the edge cases, all the things combined, to come up with a reasonably correct formulation of a story. Right? They, won't, they will think about possible ways of implementing it, not the actual implementation, because that would be too soon, but they could think of possible problems, possible issues, edge cases, all the things we individually could not come up with, but as three amigos, hey, we can do everything. Right? So the tester becomes extremely important. All these things together lead to what we call the testing pyramid. And recently there's been some literature on that the testing pyramid is wrong. At some point it becomes wrong. For now it's 
good enough. The testing pyramid basically says that at the bottom we start with the cheapest and fastest tests, which are unit tests by definition, unless you do very slow things there. But in general, unit tests are the fastest and the cheapest. So we have the most of them. Then we could have a few integration tests, which are slower and more expensive. Acceptance tests, yet slower. UI tests, almost the slowest. And smoke tests are actually tests that check whether your application was deployed successfully. Um, so they are the slowest because they require an actual running system, an actual deploy. And the tester comes there in exploratory testing, you know, clicking the critical paths of, or verifying the critical paths of the system from time to time. And you're monitoring. Because testing, nothing is ever watertight or 100% bulletproof. So you need something to alert you if after a deploy things start going wrong. Right? We have a performance issue, which we did not detect. We have a load problem somewhere. We have uh, an increased error rate after an hour or something of running. That's hard, if not impossible, to, de to detect with testing. So you need something to verify after the deployment. A pipeline could be written like this. Pipeline as code. This is uh, Jenkins, by the way. This is Jenkins code. And the nice thing about a pipeline as code is that you can co-locate it with your actual system, with your product in your repository. And we can throw away Jenkins and reinitialize it using that code. So we don't have to <coughs> click things together anymore. It's all authored this way. This code runs in a few stages. We run the tests initially. We then build a Docker image. And we push that to a, a repository somewhere. And then we deploy to staging and lastly to production. If one of the stages fails, the entire build stops. And it's a sequential system in this case. Now, the Docker file would or could look something like this. Very simple. I'm not going to go into Docker. That's for another time. Uh, and then we start deploying. This is only one way, one strategy to deploy. There are many, many more. Canary releasing, blue-green. Look them up uh, when you have time. This is what we call the rolling update. Rolling update starts with pulling the image, our Docker image, from a repository somewhere. And then we start a new container based on that new image. We wait for it to come up on a port, which, well, generally all services do, or most of them anyway. And then we do our smoke tests, AKA health checks. Did the, deploy, did the service come up correctly? And we can test that using some endpoint where we know that if we put this input in, then we expect that output. If it all goes well, we add that container into the load balancer. And the load balancer would be HAProxy in this case. And it starts receiving traffic immediately. We then remove one of the old containers from the previous version from the load balancer. And we stop and remove that. And we repeat this until all the replicas of our old version, so our previous build, are gone. And we only have replicas of the new service. Looks a little something like this in the Jenkins. We have the four stages. If one of the stages were to break, it would color red, and the rest of the stages for that build wouldn't be executed. Right? If it does break, we want feedback. The siren of shame. The siren of shame is, well, literally that. It's uh, an LED lamp with, with, uh, with a siren on it. Uh, and, and there's some audio effects. We use the foghorn and the train horn and, and all sorts of other things to attract attention. That attention is to encourage developers to immediately fix that pipeline. Because that pipeline is the only thing we have to put stuff into production. We don't do things manually anymore. So if the pipeline breaks, our development process breaks. So that's an immediate P1, P0, right? Fix it. Uh, initially, it's the pair that broke the build. We don't do naming and shaming, but uh, initially, they start working on it. If they can't figure it out, they pull in the rest of the team to get that pipeline fixed quickly. Right, closing off with some results. This whole project led to a total build time per service under 10 minutes. And the total time is from the very push to GitLab or GitHub. 
it was GitHub in this case, to the last production replica being replaced. Under 10 minutes from start to finish. 50 plus deployments per day over all the services combined. Significantly reduced the number of issues and outages. And the page load times went from 5 to 6 seconds on average to 0.5. And sometimes even lower than that. We improved audience statistics all across the board. More time on page, more pages per session, more people on the site, better CEO ranking, all those things. We got to experiment together with the team with new tech. Uh, they dabbled a little bit in Angular, Java, event sourcing, things like that. But most importantly, they had a lot more confidence, a lot more motivation, and fun. Velocity is then a bonus. Of course, there were some lessons to be learned. The team acceptance initially was not very great. Um, remember, it's a bunch of external people that say, OK, what you've been doing is essentially wrong. Uh, and they knew this, but they, there's always a little bit of pushback, which is fine. Um, but in, uh, pretty quickly, uh, everybody got to see that this was a far better way and got them out of that hole that they've been in for years. Change is hard in general. And humans are change averse, usually. They like their own patterns. But if you persist and keep at it, then, you will ha then it will happen. New technology, not everybody was as experienced with the new technology as we would like. But with pair programming, that pretty quickly turned around. Uh, and this was in 2014. So then Docker was still very much unstable. 0 0.6, 0 0.7 was the release, I think. So we had some issues with that, but in general, it was fine. Um, stability of the build pipelines, JavaScript testing mostly. That's where we had to drop the 100% code coverage rule, actually, uh, because uh, JavaScript testing usually broke for unclear reasons. Uh, business alignment. If you as a team start moving this fast and the business is still doing it the traditional way, then cracks to start to appear again in other, uh, in other parts of the company. Feature toggles, uh, I said that as soon as something is live, you need to remove the feature toggle. Well, we had a few feature toggles that were never enabled, actually, so stuff that wasn't put live as well. And if you have too much feature toggles, you have a combinatorial explosion, which you don't want as well. And at the end, uh, not enough focus on replacing the legacy app. Unfortunately, San Diego is still in production, if a small part of it, but it's still in production. Um, and it could have been out of production by now, unfortunately. Right, some literature which you can read, hopefully in the next few weeks or months. Continuous Delivery, The Bible by Jess Humble and Dave Farley. Building Microservices by Sam Newman. And a book by Matt Skelton and Steve Smith, Build Quality In, which is basically a report of about 20 projects where they implemented continuous delivery and how that worked. And below, if you want to read more about why branches are evil, then drunkbasedevelopment.com is your way to go. A little bit of a sales slide here. Make.io, we help you get faster. We help you implement continuous delivery and continuous deployment. If you're interested, come visit me or send me a mail or a Twitter. Go to my blog. I uh, write about these things, but also about event sourcing, CQRS. And I would love it if you could leave some feedback on joining on that particular link. Have you any questions? Yes, sir. The uh, feature toggle uh, when you're doing the A/B testing, so uh, checking the uh, like the amount of feedback you're getting for a new web page or anything else. Have you actually got that automated as well? The metrics, you mean, or the yeah, feature? so that it, whereby say you you've released it to ten percent of your audience, and then you might up it to fifty before you actually release it entirely. Is that all automated? Unfortunately, or? not. So the question was, uh, does the future toggle automatically increase if your metrics are at the right level? Um, we would love to have gotten there, but we didn't. Mm -hmm. in, in the time, that, then you end up with something called hypothesis-driven development, mm -hmm. which is we think that we that uh, this change will lead to that, and that's verified by or verifiable by these metrics, and if then you can automate that. Unfortunately, we didn't get there. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, I had a question. What would be your best practice to approach such a thing? Because it's quite a big problem. Well, you would write down which metrics to, to check. Yeah. 
And for example, you could say, okay, the, um, we consider the feature successful if the metrics go increase by this percentage or go above that threshold. And if they do, we increase the feature toggle by X percent, right? That could be a way. So you have some sort of feedback loop from the, the metrics, from the monitoring, back into your feature toggle setup. Would you actually consider using your monitoring tool to integrate that? Your monitoring tool yeah, I, I, would, I would definitely consider that. Something like Prometheus or other things, they have hooks. Even Nagius? Yeah, yeah, could be, yeah. Even though Nagius is more of a system monitoring. I was just going to ask about the uh, branching model where you're always committing to master. Does that mean that you're effectively only working on one feature at a time, or is everyone working on features at the same time and committing all together? So the question is, if we uh, ha only have master, are we all working on one feature? The answer is no. Uh, in principle, uh, if features are large enough and uh, compl complicated enough, they can be put behind a feature toggle. And otherwise, it would just simply be small commits towards a new feature. And you, the only thing you would sometimes have is if you are working on the exact same piece of code, you would have a small merge conflict for the individual developer. But in principle, everybody's working on the entire product, not just on one single feature. Do you ever have failing tests in master, or do you make sure that they're passing before Hopefully you Hopefully not, because that means somebody forgot to run the tests on their own machine. We didn't actually have post commit hooks or, or uh, what, that you can only push if you run the test locally. So that's more of a discipline. We trust people to do that. And you quickly learn to do that if the siren starts running again. Oh, oops. <laughs> right? I presume in? that when you have multiple services breaking down a monolith application, uh, you're working with uh, different repositories for each service or using the same? Uh, this case, uh, different repositories for different services. So mm -hmm. one service had one repository. What was the secret then of managing the different dependencies between the services? Uh, so if service A depends on the feature that's going to be deployed on service B at some point in time, how do you synchronize that? Um, yeah, that's a good point. If you, uh, but vertical development would solve most of that. So you start at the, uh, you, with, with BDD, you start outside in. With these things, you would start inside out and you would start with the lowest service and add a new endpoint there, which at that, at that moment in time is still unused, right? And then you build the code in the service which uses that endpoint, et cetera, et cetera. Or you could put it behind a feature toggle, something like that. And also API versioning, it's yep. very important. All right, thanks. Okay, your question. Uh, okay. So um, you talked about continuous uh, integration and um, well, testing and everything, but you still have a monolith there with very complex algorithms, I suppose. And your new services will have, at some point, to communicate with the uh, old features. So how would you ma manage that type of situation? Um, by not doing it. Um, and that sounds uh, very easy, but um, we try to avoid communicating with the old system as much as possible. It's n the only way it's uh, we actually communicate through the legacy database. And the legacy database is read, and the data is then transformed to a model which is better, a new model. So that's the only point of communication, actually. We don't call APIs in the old system. We only use data communication. So, and um, how would you, afterwards, because it's a, also a legacy database, how would you migrate that to a new database or a better schema? Well, one of the things they, they started doing after I left is uh, one part of the, uh, the, the job seeker part was started to become implemented as events, as event sourcing. And basically everything that happens in the old system is then written down as an event in the new system. And it's also written down as a, uh, in a new data model. And at some point, if you flip the switch, the new system will start to generate those events rather than the old system, right? And then the old system is obsolete anyway. It doesn't respond to those in things anyway. And you have those events and you have the new uh, data models essentially and you can keep them up to date like that. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, I was curious as to how this scales for um, engineering teams that are 200 to 500 engineers um, do you batch commits when it's continuously deplo deployed at all? 
Um, there are f differing views on that. Um, I know that Spotify, for example, uh, has something called, I think they call it release trains, and they deploy, um, or was it Shopify? It doesn't matter. They deploy eight times per day, something like that. And you can um, attach your commit to a train, and then it gets deployed. Um, and they have some sort of uh, feedback, like these, these commits were part of that train. Um, but other companies of, of significant size, Google, for example, has a monolithic repository, so one repository, well, all the code is, and they continuous deploy. So uh, I don't consider continuous deployment to be unscalable in the large or large teams. No, definitely not. One question here, and then I think we're slowly running out of time. Yeah. So you said you don't always use pair programming. Did you have rules of when it was safe to not pair program? Because obviously the well, the, the, the rule with, there, there's one, I, I hear a comment about pair programming, like trivial features we don't have to pair on, right? But is it always obvious from the start whether something is trivial, right? A bug fix which looks trivial could be very complicated. And for develop, regular development, it's, it's equally so. So I would say pair programming, we didn't enforce it, but we encouraged it, but also on the simple things. And sure, there were moments where people needed to take a break, like I need to be solo for a little bit, but we tried to limit that. And you find out quickly that, that this helps a lot, that this improves the quality and your own way of thinking as well. Um, it uh, guards against dropping in the rabbit hole. It doesn't, um, it's still possible, but it's less likely because you're pair programming. So people knew that even for trivial things, it was interesting as well. Okay, uh, it's time to wrap this up. Uh, if you have any further questions, then uh, uh, catch me at lunch or uh, on Twitter. Thank you so much for all your attention and have a great day. <laughs>